mine's on. So the um, the oops. I know. Oh, okay. See how much easier it was when you just hit the hit the iPhone and it goes, but um, it wasn't reliable without the whatever. Sorry, gang. I just trying to figure figure out what I don't know. <coughs> it's fun watching the game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Morning, everybody. Morning. <laughs> it was your chance, right there. That was your chance. <coughs> okay. Um, just want to read read from. <coughs> Uh, a couple other books beside the book, but this is uh, Oswald Chambers, My Utmost First Highest, and a, uh, a quote from Chambers that's always kind of stuck in my head relative to Pentecost, which is what we've been talking about uh, more recently. <clears throat> Chambers says, the purpose of Pentecost was not to teach the disciples something, but to make them the in incarnation of what they preached so that they would literally become God's message in the flesh. And he cites Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Uh, that stuck with me for years uh, relative to Pentecost, the Pentecost making us incarnation of the message. And you say, well, uh, for what reason? I just picked up uh, for whatever, you know, out of the 39 volumes or something, this is um, Schaff's edition of uh, the, well, it doesn't matter, <laughs> but in it, in it, <laughs> too, much, too much information. In it, we have Augustine's uh, City of God, right? So this is just picking anything in City of God, just picking one, one little section out of it that I thought is interesting. From uh, book 18 and chapter 49, he says, in this wicked, now this is, this is the fifth century, the fifth century, if you think things are bad now, <laughs> in the fifth century, he says, in this wicked world, in these evil days, when the church measures her future loftiness by her present humility and is exercised by goading fears, tormenting sorrows, disquieting labors, and dangerous temptations, when she soberly rejoices, rejoicing only in hope, there are many reprobate mingled with the good, and both are gathered together by the gospel as in a dragnet. And in this world, as in a sea, both swim enclosed without distinction in the net until it is brought ashore when the wicked must be separated from the good, that in the good, as in his temple, God may be all all in all. So I, I, I think, wow, <clears throat> two guys separated by uh, 13, 14 centuries, and one talking about the relevance of Pentecost to the believer's life, uh, making them an incarnation of the message, which is to say the living embodiment of the gospel that others in society see. And then Augustine decrying uh, the decadence and depravity in society as if to say it has seeped into the church herself um, such that the need, the need for uh, such as what we've been talking about. So, yeah, we've, like this is number 10. <laughs> so we talk about uh, uh, relying on the presence and power of God. I'm going to just back up a tad, which is to say not far, uh, uh, from uh, uh, two last week, a little bit of last week. We, we were talking about uh, then uh, the Holy Spirit in terms of personal experience and self-attestation, and we linked that to Jesus, Jesus' experience 
of the, of the Spirit, of receiving the Spirit on, on uh, uh, the occasion where he's baptized uh, in the Jordan by John the Baptist. So we, we return to that kind of question, then we'll deviate from it and then try to, to return back again. But this whole idea that we, like, like him, um, and even like Chambers is saying, and even like Augustine is, is saying, where are those people? As if this is the means by which uh, uh, you, you can separate the believing from the non-believing uh, world. Um, so um, the, the question that we sort of started into or, or put a little bit more flesh on last week, do we base our knowing, knowing, to put it in that, that way, not our knowledge, but our knowing on doctrine, uh, question mark, uh, do, we, do we make doctrine a framework for, for knowing? Um, how, how do we... Uh, how, how do we uh, identify then through experience what we claim to know by doctrine or what we think we know by doctrine? Another question. Another question, if our practice then uh, conforms to a doctrine that uh, lacks or is devoid of any experiential uh, validation, let's say, uh, how can we be certain that what we're doing is what the text demands? In other words, uh, has our factual knowledge outpaced, which our factual knowledge is essentially our beliefs, uh, has our factual knowledge outpaced our experience? So I think conceptually in your mind, you put like your beliefs running down a road and uh, experience is chasing, you know, to catch up. And if you're going to have knowledge, you have to have the both together. You have to have both of those together. Belief and experience gives us that sense of knowledge. Um, <clears throat> so this is evident, I suppose, because we can believe without knowing and practice without knowledge. We'd say that's lifeless, that's powerless, and all of those things, right? So maybe some little bit of an example from this, connecting, connecting a few dots and taking the time to do so. And this isn't like a, like a comprehensive thing. It's just a, an example. If we take Jesus in John chapter 13 and verse 35, which is a well-known uh, passage where Jesus says, a new commandment I give you, love, one another. <clears throat> so what's Jesus talking about here? He's not talking about factual knowledge, you know, love one another by means of factual knowledge, right? So he's, obviously they understand somewhat what love is, but he's talking about this is an experience. You know if you're loved or not, you know, and so, so this is where, you know, we're, we're going with this. So he says, as I have loved you, so love must, you must, love one another, but, but notice what he says in verse 15. By this, everyone will know that you are one of my disciples because you have love one for, for another. Now, we could ask a question like, so by what means, not does someone define what love is, but by what means does someone no, have knowledge of love, not factual knowledge, but the experience, the experience of it. Because see, again, belief is running down the road. Belief says, yeah, I read about that. I, re I did read about that love, and, and I, I, I agree that it's there. But, not, but experience is running back and says, hey, yo, yo, hey, let me, <laughs> let me catch up, let me catch up, because we got to get together before you really know it. So you see, by what means or by what mechanism then does someone actually know it? So if you look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, you're going to see two things. You're going to see number one, or at least two things. I can do better. I can give you more, but let's just go with two. One is, what in the world is this love? How do I know it when I have it? And who delivers it to me? And by what means? 
you know, where does it come from, the origin source, all these types of questions. And Paul says, hope does not put us to shame. In other words, this idea of hope is not like, categorically, it's different with the Christian. Because it's rooted in, in a different source. And so if your hope is in the things of this world, guess what? It's, mm, it's, um, it might be okay today, but, but hang on. We'll get you away from it by the, by the end of the day, if not by the end of the hour. But hope does not put us to shame. Why? Because God's love has been what? Poured out into our hearts. Has been. So referring to a, a time in the past when this occurred, and what occurred is persistent now into the future, into the present state of those believers and down through, has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So you see the relationship between the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit and spirit reception, the relationship between the Holy Spirit, spirit reception, and this intuitive, affective experience of the love of God. And so we, 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 we actually can know the love of God through the experience of it that the Holy Spirit has delivered to us. Uh, it, so, um, back to Jesus, just a little bit further. Need to put a little, little bit more on it. Um, John, staying in John chapter 17 and verse 8, Sometimes this passage, so it's the upper room discourse still. You know, this is taking place literally hours or moments before Jesus is captured, he's betrayed in the garden, and within um, hours of his crucifixion. And sometimes referred to as this part of the upper room discourse as Jesus' high priestly prayer, you know, his his uh, role, not only as Messiah, but the one who's mediating on our behalf. Um, and so he's saying, Father, the hour has come. You know, glorify your son. But I, I want to go down to verse 6, 7, 8. For I gave them, I gave them, the, now we're talking about his disciples and the certainty, having certainty of the knowledge of what they're hearing. We're just trying to split hairs between fact, well, it's more than splitting hairs. We're trying to draw strong categorical distinctions between factual knowledge and experiential knowledge and how all that works and how does that even apply here with Jesus. But notice what he says about his disciples. For I gave them the words you gave me. This is remata, remata. Um, in the Greek, so it's different than logoi, right? Logoi is, is um, uh, uh, the words that uh, are consistent with reason and written words and things of that nature, but remata are spoken words. So in other words, Jesus is saying, the Father has spoken some things to me that I am passing on to them. So I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you. So it's a little bit expanded translation in the NIV, but this idea of they knew with certainty. So we're trying to understand then by what means um, and what, what this looks like, because Jesus is making a distinction between he, he, his saying of these words and then their knowledge of what he is saying and to what degree, right? So knowing with, with certainty. <clears throat> so um, th these are not words on a page to be read. This is Jesus saying this. So in order for his disciples to have any kind of certainty whatsoever, that would be based on the source and based on Jesus himself. So the reference here is not to words on a page, but the reference is to a person 
to be believed. Is this person credible or not? And these are the questions that the disciples would work through. And by now they're realizing that, you know, what Jesus is saying is certainly credible and they're accepting this. So what does that have to do with the role of the Holy Spirit? You know, so, so we could go to other places and show that when the Holy Spirit comes, he is, um, uh, he is the same rank and file of Jesus. So what Jesus was to the disciples in the flesh, so the Spirit is now uh, to the people of God, right? And so it's the Spirit's role with the written word, the preserved word today. Think about it, right? Think about the difference between a person without the Spirit picking up Scripture, reading it. I'm not talking just about interpreting it and, you know, all that stuff, because there, there are, you know, believe me, because, you know, where I finished one degree, um, there were many people who were reading the Greek. And, well, I remember when I defended my uh, dissertation in Wales, um, you know, I'm there with nothing except uh, this. And they're, they've got their Hebrew text, so they got their Greek text open. And, they're, you know, and you, it was questionable whether they, you know, it was, it was sort of like the Bart Ehrmans of this day. It, it was like, it's a fascination to them to study the antiquities and, and the Bible included. It was different from where I'm coming from, you know, which is partly a missional aspect as to why I did my <laughs> research there. Um, so how is it that we can pick up Scripture and hear these words, hear, hear these words as though they're the spoken words to us, but hear these words and have a degree of certainty about this? You know, that's different. That is completely different than you having the intellectual apparatus to be able to understand. You know, even Peter said of Paul, my word, what is this guy off his rocker? Of course, that's a paraphrase, but he's like, come on. You know, I can't even figure out what he's, you know, half the time, but Peter's a, a fisherman, right? Peter's a guy that's going to work hard, you know, and here's Paul's a scholar, and he's like, come on, Paul, put some cookies on the, the lower shelf so the rest of us can have access to this thing. So it's not about understanding or how intellectual you are, but it's just about having that sense that, um, uh, of certainty about what's, being, about what's being written. So not to, not to park a long time there, but just sort of like introduce that to us a little bit so you can appreciate the difference between belief, experience, and knowledge. You really should just kind of lock in on that right now. So the analogy, and I thought that was a good analogy if, if you don't like it, just don't tell me, it hurt my feelings. But, but so you got belief running down the road and you got experience there and belief, because I think we can all agree, we, we believe a, a lot more than we know by experience. I mean, that's, that's not controversial, right? So, you know, because why, why? Because we're ready to, you know, it's like Billy Graham used to say when they asked him, Hey, what about that part in the Bible? You know that part where um, uh, Jonah got swallowed by, of course they said whale, but Jonah got swallowed by a great fish. Remember that part? And they said to Billy Graham, you don't believe that, do you? And he says, I'll tell you what, if it's in the word of God, I'd believe it if Jonah swallowed the whale. <laughs> That's what he said. So we all, you know, we, we, we come to the scriptures this way, and we come to the scriptures with this idea that, listen, I'm, I'm re I don't care what, it, I, I'm ready to accept it. And we hear critics that will, but, but there's this inconsistency and we found, and, and we're like, okay, but you know, maybe I can see that. And we put the word apparent in front of inconsistency. <laughs> maybe it's, a, maybe it's a, an apparent, you know, inconsistency, but, but how many of those have, it's like saying, uh, um, you know, the Hittite civilization, see, the Bible's wrong, you know, because there is no Hittites until, until, until they're doing some archaeological dig in, in Turkey and find out, ooh, you know, what are all these, uh, whether they're clay tablets or whatever, they're coming out with certain Hittite kings and Hittite dynasty and all this stuff and thinking, um, yep, oops, I guess we were wrong again. So, 
at any rate, we're predisposed, because, we're predisposed to believe and, and trust, but I'm telling you, it's not even that predisposition that's going to get you there. It's the Holy Spirit who, who attests, you know, that these, almost to the point where, remember where it said about Jesus um, that uh, no one, even the scribes were saying, no one ever spoke like this. No one, you know, and, and what they were saying is his words are self-authenticating. That's what they were saying. What do they mean? So any scribe, if you, if you want to see some of my crazy research with all the footnotes, you, you are citing, you're citing, 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 citing someone else, you know, to be in the scholarly world and con contribute in that discussion. So the scribes did the same thing. Just read. No, don't, don't. But pull a page out of the Talmud. Okay, pull, just pull a page out. You have the Gemara and then you have um, the... Uh, it goes in boxes like this. These are the margins. And you go from the, what the rabbis, their commentaries, and they're always citing another rabbi, you know, like, like this and throughout. And it's voluminous, right? But Jesus, Jesus with that audience just steps out and starts talking. And wow, nobody spoke like this. He speaks as one having authority. Not like the scribes and the Pharisees. So the scribes and the Pharisees, yada, 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 citing this one, this one, this one, this one. You know, you, you all know the most famous debate, the uh, um, uh, Hillel and Sh uh, Shemai and, you know, that, you know, type of, but that's nothing. That's like all over the place. Matter of fact, in the rabbinical schools, <laughs> you'd have a room about this size, maybe, let's say, and you paired off. And they'll just throw, this is how they're trained, they'll throw a, a, a text out of the Torah, not debate it. Okay, so if it's you two guys, then Rick, you take, you take the four position, and Rick, you take the opposed position, and then and they literally start yelling at each other, and the whole room doing this at the same time. It sounds like a chaotic mess of everybody yelling at each other, vehemently arguing, then it's okay, switch it up. Now you take the... The con side, you take that, and, and you have to argue with that, that vehemently. So the idea that someone comes along and it's self-authenticating, so what, is, what does that mean? You don't question. It's, it's unquestioned. And sure, we have questions, but the idea that of this not having authenticity to us is like a fairy tale. It's, it's like, well, of course it does. So blah, 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 all that to say that that isn't to diminish the role of the Holy Spirit because that's, the role of the Holy Spirit is the one that gives us that, however you want to describe it, you know, whatever word, however you want to describe that, gives us that sense that we never had before. You know, you know it'd be like someone um, who is not, and I've been there, you know, with folks and witnessing and Someone would say, but what if I find out later on that it's not true, right? I can remember, I just think into the guys, you know, when I say that, I mean all the ARCs across the Northeast and, and having a whole room full of guys and one of the most common things, yeah, but Doug, you know, there's, there's all those religions out there. What if, what if I go all in on yours and then I find out somehow down the road, you know, Oh, that Bible was wrong or some, you know. So that's a fair question, right? But yet we know that once we enter into life, those types of things, again, we can have good questions. We can have questions. We can have questions. But that self-authenticating witness of the Holy Spirit with regard to Scripture, that's something that's universally known by by believers, or it's cultivated, or it's something. This is, this is part of what the Holy Spirit brings. So all of this can beg the question, then, how do we know what we claim to believe? Again, if you don't understand the difference between belief, experience, and knowledge, if you can't, however, well, you come up with your own analogy, but if you can't, you know, that, that model tries to separate those three things out. 
And then, then how, how do you know what you claim to believe? So it's fundamentally the Spirit's role, talking about beliefs out there running away with the show and he's getting way down the road. And if you don't pay attention and let experience catch up, then experience may never catch up. What do I mean by that? How many believers do you know in churches that you never hear them talk about? You only hear them, maybe they're purely descriptive in the Christian life, you know, maybe just purely descriptive. They're always describing things. I, I mean, you know, some factual knowledge of something. And this, but this is fundamental Holy Spirit one-on-one, -on -one, or one-on-one, -on -one. yeah, that's true too, uh, to convert factual knowledge to experience truth. So it could be a prayer that you write in the, in the front somewhere. Lord, don't let my head get full of beliefs and my heart vacant of experience, you know? What, let's, let's make sure that like you see those runners bunched up in the Olympics, you know, and they're running that marathon. Let's be sure that belief somehow doesn't separate himself and go flying way ahead. You know, let's make, make sure that we're taking care of experience too. So again, we have help. We have help in the role of the Holy Spirit. Only then do we see this radical transformation in our life. So we know we've been paying attention to belief and experience and our knowing, and our knowing of something. So point to any place in the Bible um, and you can say, uh, do I believe it? Yes. Do I know it? Hmm. Right? And th this, is, this, is where, this, this is where we find ourselves. So transformation and the ra what do I mean by radical transformation? I mean something that is beyond you to perform. You know, this is a new birth. This is a spiritual birth. This is um, something uh, supernatural, something of supernatural origin. You're not going to get there by natural means. This is why the Holy Spirit, and we say radical, we mean something that someone else would say, observing you, listening to you, watching you, getting to know you would say, this person has been changed in a way that, no, that you can't. It's not physically uh, possible, right? And we could cite plenty of evidence. Even in your own life, you can say, wow, but for the grace of God, even on your worst day, your absolute worst day, as a child of God, you say, oh, but for the grace of God, you know, or you see some poor, some poor soul. I remember I hit a a deacon once that used to remind me time and time again, you know, and say, well, Brother Doug, we could be sitting on a bar stool somewhere, but here we are by the grace of God, right? And that's, I mean, left to ourselves, what would we be or what would we become? And the, and the radical transformation. So we can't say, oh, look at what I've done, just like in salvation, so in sanctification. We can't say, look at what I've done. I'm a super Christian because, because, we have only one source for this transformation, and that's the Spirit of God. So only then does our conduct align with the truth. Let's look at another example, and, and uh, I just threw this out there last week and, and did what I usually did, you know, fly over it at 30,000 feet. Um, so again, conduct aligning with, with truth. How do we get there? What's the means? John 8? Take John 8, for example, in one little episode, and we're not, we're not sort of saying, um, you know, trying to line up texts and say, I, I'm just finding examples, just examples, because they're everywhere. But John 8, 31 through 38, do you remember this exchange between Jesus and uh, the Jews, right? Uh, Jews, of course, not accepting him as, as a Messiah and... Uh, and certainly all of that antipathy is growing and growing and growing, right? Um, some of the Jews flocking around him because at first they, they are thinking, yeah, maybe, maybe he is the one. Look at the miracles, look at, look at things, you know, uh, that he says or hear what he says and does. But Jesus begins here, if, for example, you've, 
you know, focus on the opening verses, John 8, 31, 30. Jesus begins here almost asserting that it is raw belief, almost the opposite of what I just told you, that it's raw belief which delivers liberty from bondage. For example, verses 31 and 32, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, now notice this idea of belief is not, this, not what you're thinking. It, it's not this idea of savingly or fully resting in him, as, because all of them you know, are going to you know, go the other way. But so Jesus is going to make our case between belief and experience, and he's going to root experience in a very particular way to get knowledge. So watch how he does this, right? So, I mean, if you don't know, you know, like the first part, but now knowing it, now you look at it and you say, wow, hey, this makes sense. All of a sudden, the text makes sense now. Not that it didn't before, but it might just be a little episode of some exchange between Jesus and the Jews, you know, and we might pull out of that something. He says, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. And what does that seem to be saying? That it's just by raw belief. Just believe what I'm saying, and then you're truly my disciples. But, but reading further, we see that true freedom is not related to factual knowledge or belief, but to experience. In other words, look at verse, verse 35. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family. So you could believe him all day long and still be a slave. But he says, now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So what is he doing? He's linking belief and experience and knowledge to sonship. You, you know if you're a son or not. You know, the, the, these are, the, this is, he's talking about this most intimate sense. For example, you know, you're going to go, we read from John 17, Father, he starts his prayer. This, and we've been talking about this recently, this whole notion of Jesus' relationship with the Father that becomes ours, Abba, Father, you know, that becomes ours, right? So a son belongs. In other words, one can believe, listen, one can still believe but have the wrong father. That ought to unnerve people right there. Even talking to the average Christian and saying the difference between belief, experience, and knowledge, and plenty of people will say that they believe, but they are assenting to truth. In other words, what they're saying is, yeah, I see that and I agree that it's true, but do they know it to be true? So, for example, and, and Jesus is linking this to sonship. What would be available to the people of God by means of the new birth? Now, how does he do this? You know, it's verse Verse 38, for example, I'm telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you are doing what you have heard from your Father, he says to the Jews. The Jews that believed on him. Did you catch that at the beginning? The Jews that believed on him. Now he's, he's saying to them, but you're slaves and not sons. So in this whole household construct, you're a slave and have no permanent place here. But as a son, you have this. And he's speaking, you know, culturally to them. So true sons are those who have entered into the family of God and recognized the voice of the shepherd. Is there someplace else in John? So say two pages over. John chapter 10 and verses 27 and 28, Jesus says, my Sheep, listen, I, see if this sounds like experience. If this sounds like ex experience, right? My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. No one shall snatch them out of, out of my hand. What we're queuing in there is not so much the preservation of what God gives us, secure in the hand of God, as much as the Speaking, listening, speaking, listening, that type of, of knowledge, knowledge of God. So this is the language of experience and attestation. So let's see how far we get with a, you know, this is kind of where I just drew out a little bit of last week. But now we want to see Jesus, the spirit bearer. And we spent some time in Isaiah's uh, book 
talking about, uh, you know, the, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And certainly Jesus said that to those gathered in the synagogue in Luke chapter 4 in Nazareth. So the spirit bearer, but he's also the spirit giver. So what happened to Jesus at the Jordan is a pattern. The fancy, the, the expensive word is paradigmatic. So it's a pattern of what, and, and I would say it's programmatic as well. It's programmatic. What happened to Jesus at the Jordan is programmatic in terms of when you come to Pentecost. It's programmatic because you're going to tie it in to Joel's prophecy. Um, well, we won't get ahead of ourselves, but we just keep that word programmatic on the back burner. Um, so it's, 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 it's a pattern of what happened to the disciples prophetically. I'll make a distinction here. Prophetically in the upper room, and that's John chapter, we've been here before, John chapter 20 and verse 22. So it's, uh, it, it is, uh, so this is, this is what's happening prophetically, and I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Um, and of course, John 20, 22, some, some have referred to this as the Johan, Johannine Pentecost, although I wouldn't personally refer to it as that. But it's also proleptic or sort of like um, a, a preview of uh, what's happening to uh, the same disciples here in John 20, 22, plus one to get to the full 12. Um, and the worshipers then gathered on the day of Pentecost. And all that is, uh, you know, for example, Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4, where it says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And who's, who's all together? Then you go back to uh, 115 and 120, and inclusive among that would be the 11 plus then Matthias comes along and you have the 12, right? So here's all these kind of numbers, but they're all, um, they're all intended by Luke in the context, which we won't get to just this week, to demonstrate the corporate nature of what happened uh, on this day in, uh, in Pentecost. But for now, we're just looking at the spirit bearer and the spirit giver. So I will, I will fully uh, unravel uh, all of that, uh, I promise, in, in due course. But note, note in Acts 2, 1 through 4, let me go back there, what Luke does. So Luke includes in this account auditory and visual phenomena, right? So what is, what is he saying? Um, Imagine you're there, either at the colonnaded precincts or wherever you might have been in and in around the, the temple area. Suddenly, a sound, a sound like a freight train, and it filled the whole house. They saw, so you have auditory and visual. Notice that they saw what seemed to be these cloven tongues of fire. Um, so in all whether in all four Gospels, the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, Matthew 3, 16 and 17, Mark 1, 9 through 11, Luke 3, 21, 22, John 1, 29 to 34. In all four of those, auditory and visual, auditory and, and visual. But at least for Luke, that his, his Gospel and the book of Acts both find these details to be significant. Because what did I say? We're having a pattern there. There's a pattern between what happened to Jesus at the Jordan with the Spirit, receiving the Spirit. What happened to... Now, that receiving can be different in nature, you know, and that's a whole, whole other discussion. But still, the pattern is there. Um, so, uh, Luke includes this uh, in his accounting of the day of Pentecost, as Jesus was given, you know, why? Why the auditory and the visual? Why this? Why this? Because it's tangible evidence uh, to initiate his public ministry. Where is his public ministry? So we see it. We see it. And it goes into uh, Jesus full of the Spirit, goes out into the wilderness, be tempted of the devil. And then, then we find he returns uh, in the, in the 14, in the Luke 4, 14, in the power of the Spirit, keep going, Luke 4, 18 and following. He's, he's there reading from the scroll of Isaiah. Um, 
in Nazareth at the synagogue. And today the, these words are fulfilled, you know, in, in your ears, right? So the, we see the initiation of his public ministry. Well, what about the body? Of, what about the corporate body of Christ? Where does that get its initiation? And so Luke is saying this without having to say it specifically. Oh, it all starts here. You know, he doesn't have to use that language because Joel prophesied it, Isaiah prophesied it, Ezekiel gave, had a personal experience of the vision. Jesus demonstrates it to the 11 in the upper room. And then we, we see, and, and by virtue of his teaching and the Olivet Discourse, upper room discourse, sorry, and all these things, we see this, this occurring, but we won't get ahead of ourselves here. Um, so here's tangible evidence. Uh, at the Jordan by Jesus to, to initiate this public ministry under the influence and by the power of the Spirit. Remember, we, we attach also um, Acts 10, 38 to that, where Peter is, is basically uh, stating this. But so also the Christian movement as a corporate body began this epic of the Spirit this movement of Christ followers under the power and influence of the Spirit. So that's the parallel between the Jordan experience of Jesus and these um, worshipers gathered on the day of Pentecost. So Luke, Luke is careful, this is Acts 2.33, Luke is careful to identify Jesus as the Spirit giver, right? So the spirit bearer becomes the spirit giver. Acts chapter 2 and verse 33, exalted to the right hand of God, he, Peter points out, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. And that's in the context of whose prophecy that Peter says, that's Joel. I will pour out my spirit, you know, after these things. I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, so on. So Jesus had earlier prophesied um, the coming of the spirit. And he prophesied in both word and deed. Both word and deed. That's important. He prophesied in both word and deed, the coming of the spirit. How so? So look at Luke chapter 24. And uh, verse 49, and he says, I'm going to send you. I'm going to send you. So who is the spirit giver? I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power on high. Why? Don't go off half cocked, powerless. It's that whole difference. The whole difference is between belief and do you, do you want people um, who are promoting whatever you have by sheer belief, they read the manual, or do you want people that are absolutely convinced that what they're saying is true, for example? That's what you read in the opening portion of uh, Acts chapter 1 that Jesus is appearing to them and giving them many convincing proofs. So they're not just going off espousing some doctrine that, that only separates the scribes from the, the, I'm sorry, the Pharisees from the Sadducees, you know, with all their doctrinal particulars. Oh, we got another Jewish sect. It's those Christianoi, you know, it's those Followers of the one who claims to be the Jews Messiah. That's how you would translate that. So we now we have three sects going around. We got the the Pharisaic virgin, uh, uh, virgin, virgin, the version of the Sadducees. We could throw the Essenes in there too. And now we've got these these deluded other Jews that just think that this Jesus is the Messiah. Um, and so he's saying clothed, endued with power from Link that to 2.33. And this poured out. Link that to Joel's prophecy. And it all comes together. But that's word. That's word. That's not deed. That's word. That's word. So Jesus is going to do this prophetically by here 
prophesying to them. This is him, you know, gr grabbing this role of a prophet, and he's prophesying this. You stay here, that's going to happen. And he says it that emphatically. Just, just check it in the original. He says it that emphatically. John chapter 14, um, again, in word. John chapter 14, beginning at verse 12. 12. Verily, or verily, right? What translation you end up? Very truly, I tell you, all who have faith in me will do the works I am doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will, and I will do it. Great, but we're not talking about that. If you love me, keep my commandments. I'll ask the Father. He will give you another. You know, there's either heteros or alos, you're right, right? So it's heteros is another of a different kind, or alos, another of the very same kind. So just as I have stood beside you, been a comfort to you, been a help to you, been a friend to you, you are going to see no categorical change. The program stays the same. I'm going up and the Spirit's coming down to fulfill that very same role. Help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. That The world cannot accept Him because it neither sees Him or what? Knows Him. You see, once you, you know, have a grid and you, begin, you can begin to separate, you can see it in everything that Jesus, Jesus teaches. But so much for word. But then when you see deed, you go to John chapter 20. Again, that upper room exchange with the disciples. Now Jesus raised, and John 20 and 22, he appears to them, and he says, and he breathes, he breathes on them, and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. On them is not in the original text, by the way, but the verb refers to just he breathes, he breathes. You know, I could, I could make a case lexically for on them, but it, there's no preposition there, really. But I could still make the case, right? But that wasn't the intention of the writer. It's the idea that he, he breathed. And so you see, you see in this particular passage some way of rooting the word with the deed. The question is, what in the world did the deed, and we have to finish, finish here because we're running out of clock, um, how do you understand the deed then? He's blowing on them. He's blowing on them. How, how do you understand that? You know, so you just see a guy sitting there and <sighs> blowing, blowing. This is, what, what in the world is this? So it's most likely, number one, a prophetic demonstration. That's what prophets do. They, uh, just, just check Ezekiel. He's the, he's the most frequent uh, one uh, prophet to employ physically. He's going to lay on one side, so on, lay on the, you know, he's, they're doing the build, build a wall, Ezekiel, then attack it, you know, all this stuff. So Jesus is doing much like John the Baptist with the clothes that he wore and, and all these types of things. Jesus is doing the same thing here, but it's just a simple breathing out, you know, in kind of an unusual and unexpected way. And so it's a prophetic demonstration of what both Joel and Isaiah prophesied, which we'll, we'll pick up on this next week, what both of them prophesied and what Ezekiel experienced. It's this valley of dry bones. And maybe we can pick up on this next week, but I'll just throw it out there for now. We could pick up on this. We'll start with Ezekiel next week. But Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14, and I want you to see this exchange between God and Ezekiel. God says, I will make uh, breath enter you. And he's talking about, remember the bones? And now they begin to come together, and it's this great army, but it's not a very threatening one because there's no life in them. There's no breath in them. All this is typical of the nation of Israel. And you link that to now the 11 plus 1, and what's happening there, which is just quite uh, interesting, the correlation um, so he says, I will, I will make breath, I will make it enter into you. Um, and then, so Ezekiel did what God told him. Uh, so I prophesied, I prophesied, prophesied to the wind, right? So, or 
translation would be to the, to the breath. So he says, I prophesied, but there, uh, there was no breath in them. And then God says, prophesy to the breath. And he says, well, breath entered into them. A little out of order there, I apologize. But so he prophesies, nothing happens. And God says, oh, prophesy to the breath. And he does. And breath entered into them. So Ezekiel says, uh, and I am going, then he says later, I am going to open your graves. Now that's a reference to giving life. He's not talking about, uh, you know, like physical graves being opened in that regard, but he's talking about, I'll open your graves. And then he explains, I will put my spirit in you and you will live. Jesus, in fact, gives us some hint to this, right? Because you're saying he's blowing the wind. What if his disciples were re remembering, although they weren't there, but we see another occasion when Jesus spoke similarly. Remember with Nicodemus. And he's having this whole exchange with Nicodemus. And ex 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 except you are born from above, you can't enter, enter the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus saying, well, yeah, yeah, how does that work? How does, it, does somebody enter, enter back into their, their mother? And then how, how does that work? And, uh, and, and he says, he says these, these things just can't be. And then, you know, Jesus sort of saying, really? Like, you're like the guy. You, you are the teacher in Israel. You're the guy. You're the one everybody goes to. You're the guy. And you don't know this? And then remember Jesus says, the wind blows where it will. So he's making reference to the fact of the wind in terms of how it operates, how it functions, that the wind has the property of being unseen as in terms of its essence, but visible in terms of its influence. And so he says, this, this is what it will be. This is, what it will, this, is, this is the new program coming, hence the word programmatic. This is the new program coming. And it's going to be such that uh, my people will experience this wind. And so the reference for Nicodemus would never be ahead to Pentecost. Nothing happened on the Jewish Pentecost, you know, in terms of, you know, it's, it's being an occasion after Passover and all. Nothing happened like this. But it's going back to Ezekiel's prophecy. He says, I'm going to bring life. I'm going to uh, restore all this. But we'll get into that a little bit more next time. Let's finish here. Lord, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for, um, uh, as, as we said, uh, your, your spirit who, even if we can't comprehend everything, uh, we, or, or much of it, um, we, we, we do have the sense that, that what we are seeking to understand are your very words, and we love your word. And without your word, we're just, we're dry, barren people. And without your spirit, we're dry, lifeless, barren people like, like those bones in that valley. So thank you, Lord, for uh, giving us uh, wisdom and understanding. Uh, bless us in our own personal lives as we leave this place to uh, take with us uh, that reminder that we do bear witness to you, uh, not just in words, but through uh, how uh, we experience you. And, and uh, maybe just to think how, maybe how far our beliefs are outpassing our experience and just to put on the brakes, the brakes and revisit what we believe and wait until we have knowledge of that, true, true knowledge. That's so transformative in our lives. Gives us hope, gives us peace, gives us trust, reliance in you. Uh, it, it draws us ever upward away from all the stuff of this world and causes us just to glance in a heavenly fashion where our true hope is. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.